In 2012, a team of British researchers asked the question, what would happen if we treated 20 people suffering from severe depression with magic mushrooms? It took them three years to get permission to find out. I've tried, I think, maybe six or eight different antidepressants and they've never worked. Maggie, I, I can't believe how patient she's been. Four years ago, I realised that I couldn't go on like this. You know, she didn't deserve that. I need to find a way to change. About 50% of people don't respond to antidepressants, and one in six of them go on to kill themselves. So we really should be exploring every other treatment available. With me, what I've always been desperate to do is to try and find a physical reason for feeling this way. Although I didn't want to take my life, I didn't want to wake up. I wanted to go to sleep, just not have to face it again. Depression's so prevalent, everyone's exposed to it. We're looking at giving psilocybin to patients with quite severe treatment-resistant major depression. So I don't think it's normal to feel the way I do, the anxiety, the fear, the terror, panic. If this is living, then it sucks. It really does. LSD was isolated by Stuhl and Hoffman in a Sandoz pharmaceutical company of Basel, Switzerland. The door swung wide open for research into the nature of the schizophrenic process and in a larger sense into the biochemistry of psychosis. Between 1950 and 1965, 40,000 patients were prescribed a psychedelic drug for neuroses, schizophrenia and psychopathy. These trials resulted in over 1,000 scientific papers you feel happy now? Oh. Is that a beautiful experience, would you say? Oh. I would say yes. When psychedelics became available to the wider public in the 1960s, dramatic changes in attitudes and behavior followed. This is one area where we cannot have budget cuts because we must wage what I have called total war against public enemy number one in the United States, the problem of dangerous drugs. In 1971, under pressure from President Nixon, the UN declared that all psychedelic drugs should be classified as Schedule I. One of the difficulties in terms of Schedule I drugs, including psilocybin, is that because they're in Schedule I, this has discouraged any research into the med medical value of that drug and there's been virtually nothing in the way of research uh, ever since the 1960s. With backing from the Medical Research Council, the team of the Beckley Imperial Research Programme are conducting the first ever medical trial of psilocybin, the active ingredient of magic mushrooms. This isn't a job to rush if you think that somebody could have one of the most profound experiences of their whole lives in here. Ready for the music? Yeah. That was taken, it was the winter of 2010, when it was really cold and we had a lot of snow. Is that a happy time? 
It was, yeah. Yeah, it was really nice. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. What's happening today? Going down to Imperial. Uh, it's actually Hammersmith Hospital. And um, tomorrow is the first dosing day. Can you put into words how important this is? <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's a tough one. Well, we woke up, Maggie got a call, was it, you got? We got saying, a phone call at half past five. Saying that there was a flood, so... <laughs> Maggie put her Wellingtons on, I put my <laughs> waders on, and the kids were asleep upstairs, so we thought they'd probably save. We went into the kitchen for some reason. We came in the back door, your kitchen. There was a, a trickle in the, the kitchen. We just thought, oh, well, let's it's just... It's not much. It's just a bit of water, bit. We'll, be, we'll be fine. Then the next thing we knew that... It, when we come back a few hours later... ...up to the step in there. How did that affect? you in the knowledge of the trial coming up? Um, well, at that point, I thought, I'm, I'm not going to do it. I can't do it. But for me, it's the last chance, I think. This is it. You know, I don't think there's any other medicines. I've tried all these ones that's been made in a lab, and none have worked. You know, they've all had very short-term impacts, and then nothing. Over the past 30 years, I've had maybe 30 different types of medication, um, antidepressants. Some of them have worked for a short time, some have worked for a bit longer, but they all kind of tail off. I also had uh, ECT, I had 23 um, sessions of that, which I've been told worked for period, but then the effects you know, wore off, so I do feel like this trial is another kind of last chance to make any kind of change for me, but I felt that before. Robin Carhart-Harris is the trial lead and head of psychedelic research at Imperial College. I have suffered from clinical depression. You know, I've been through some dark times, so I think that kind of thing helps you have sympathy for um, people who suffer from mood disorders in general. Psychedelics are, for me, easily the best tool that exists to study both the mind and the brain. I think it has the potential to, to revolutionise depression treatment, uh, if not psychiatry. Professor David Nutt, head of neuropsychopharmacology, will oversee the trial. This part of the brain is called the cortex. And in the cortex, you do your hearing and your seeing, etc. But also in this part of the cortex, particularly this bit here, goes from the front here to the back here, uh, there's the sense of self. It integrates what you can see and hear and with what you can think and feel. And serotonin is an important chemical in the brain. It's a fundamental neurotransmitter for regulating brain function, particularly in the emotional sphere. And what psilocybin and other plant products do is to stimulate those receptors. And by stimulating them, we can mimic serotonin in the brain and sometimes perhaps do more than serotonin is doing, because in some people, serotonin may not be working adequately. Baroness Molly Meacher has spent 10 years as a crossbencher in the House of Lords campaigning for the liberalisation of drug laws. The UK governments tend to be very conservative on drug policy. 
much more conservative than many Western European co countries and, of course, the vast majority of US states. And that's something to do with our media, I think. They've been very hostile to reform in this area, which is probably something to do with the conservatism of the British people. There are 16 ways in which drugs can do harm to you or to society. There are nine ways they can harm the user, and those are the blue bars and the size of the red bar that harm the drug to society. So alcohol is the most harmful drug in Europe and the UK, and the reason for that is the size of that red bar. It's not the most damaging drug to the user. Beyond to the right, then you have heroin and crack and, and methamphetamine. They have bigger blue bars. And the drugs that the media get hysterical about, they're on the right-hand side. They're ecstasy, LSD, magic mushrooms. They have virtually no harm to society and considerably less harm to the user than alcohol or tobacco. Making these drugs illegal stops people researching them. Even though the UN conventions say, oh, we're perfectly happy for you to carry on researching them, you just have to comply with the regulations. No one has managed to get through those regulations to do a clinical trial of LSD in 50 years. Um, what do you think does have to happen in order for decriminalisation to happen in the UK? Like, is it with a politician or is it with the research? Is it with the people? What, what has to happen is we've got to have a completely public debate and you've got to hold MPs up to account when they are either not discussing this or talking rubbish about it. And the media too, you know, when people are lying about the harms of drugs, you've got to challenge them all the time. So where are we off to now? We're going to go and uh, pick up the capsules. It's going to be quite a high dose, 25 milligrams. And why are they down here? Uh, it's a, hi, Matt. How's it going? You yeah. all right? Let's get the key out. For sure. Uh, so the drug has to be stored securely. Um, in order to do research with Schedule 1 drugs, we need a home office license. So it's stored in this secure area in a locked safe that's actually bolted to the wall. What exactly is this? This is psilocybin, so this is the psychoactive uh, ingredient in so-called magic mushrooms. How does that compare to a sort of recreational dose? It's quite a high dose actually, two and a half grams of mushroom material or you know, hundreds, a uh, couple of hundred uh, little Liberty Cap magic mushrooms, so anyone you know, doing that, you, you'd consider it really taking quite a high dose. So, yeah, there's no messing about. So I'm ready for the exam. You can't go on living like you have done for the last 20 years because it doesn't get better. It does get worse. Yeah, when I think back to late November last year. That was about as bad as it had got. Uh, and that was, that, that's, that scared me. But we're, we're beyond that. Um, I'm, I'm extremely lucky to be here. It's a bit showery today, isn't it? Yeah, very nice. <laughs> Please go away. Please go away. <laughs> oh. Please go away. Oh God, no. No, 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 no. No, no, no. No, no. 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 With Andy, if you asked him what had been making him struggle or depressed, he would say experiences with his work and not feeling good enough there. But that didn't even come into the sessions at all. And it was more about his early childhood experiences of suffering and pain. He wants to get in. He wants to get in. Okay. 
What about letting it in? You, we're no. here with you, Andy. No, 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 no. 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 These kind of early childhood experiences will often be repressed. People can go through their whole lives without ever really facing those, those demons. But it's not as if the demons, when they're pushed down, don't cause any suffering because they're there. It is so evil. Just let it be here and see what it's here to show you, oh, knowing that you're safe. It won't go away, it won't go away. Just a small improvement would be lovely. Just for him to feel differently about things and see the world through a different pair of eyes. left lots and lots of questions really but those I think the answers of those will come out in a good time yeah dad was there good. dad was there good. yeah oh, that's lovely. yeah a couple of times really actually nice. a couple of times really he was there nice. where it was headed it was dangerous to me it was a dangerous path but uh, no no it's all we're okay now we're okay you're okay all is resolved. I could feel that he was suffering so much, but I could also feel that it was really important for him to be suffering. So I was kind of pleased in a weird way that he was going through it, thinking, yes, now we're getting to the stuff. You know, this is what's been causing you so much suffering. So we need to get it out. And he was really in a battle with a large, dark, evil force um, that he associated with his mum. Go away. Go away. You're not coming in. There was so much darkness and so much pain there were moments of thinking, where is this going to go? How's it going to be by the end of the day? You know, is, what if this doesn't get resolved? There was a sense from the last session of his dad being kind of wonderful and his mum being kind of terrible and evil. <laughs> well done, Dad. Well, yeah, well done, Dad. Well done. What sort of evolved out of today was that it really doesn't matter if there was one person doing right, the other one doing wrong. What actually matters at the end is resolution and love because that, that is the big thing that came out for me today is that the more you hate something, the more you feed it with that hate, the bigger it gets. And that's what's been going on. I've been feeding this thing. It's been consuming me. And now I've got to the realization that if I stop feeding it with hate, it evaporates. It goes away. Yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Of course it is. Are you out? And as soon as that realisation occurred, because I had the representation of my father and Vonnie and the boys on my chest, but I didn't have a representation of mum. So I took a picture and brought her in to that, that union, really, at the end. And we were, we were kind of one again, but one hell of a battle. Wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do it again. I've been the happiest ever in my life and I've been 
the most terrified in my life in the same day, probably in the space of half an hour. Is that good? Mm, really good. Exhausting, but really, really very good. And I mean, well, the proof is in the pudding, you know. Today, today was good. It was intense, it was good, it was tough. All the things I hoped for. But we will see how Andy is feeling tomorrow, next week. And the really key thing is in a week, a month, a few months, that's what's really important. <sighs> Hi, yeah. Uh, yeah, good to see you. How are you doing? All right. Good. Good. Yeah, we're all right. Yeah. 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 My mind's been racing about, you know, what could, what could be it, what could be this, or what could be that. And mm -hmm. lots of different sort of nightmares about. You have had some. Oh yeah, yeah. But more about um, what it could be that's coming this time. You know. I think we should get into the room uh, well ahead of time and settle down and we'll talk to the others. Mm -hmm. Last week we had somebody in the study who had a particularly strong response to psilocybin, probably the strongest psychedelic experience I've ever I've ever sat with. So that's kind of raised raised my kind of alertness really about today. It's just a reminder really never to underestimate the power really of, of, um, of a psychedelic drug and, and the alterations in consciousness that they can induce. Tell us what's on your mind. It just feels like it's stopped. It feels like it, I just don't want to go home, that's all. That's why I go home? Yeah. Okay. I, just, I don't know, it just, this isn't, I, I mean, did you really get... Today, John nearly left, which was quite a dilemma for us, because on the one hand, we wanted to keep him here and keep him safe, but we also didn't want to keep him here against his will, so it was difficult. It's probably a little bit early for you to go, is yeah. I mean, can you just hold on for a little bit longer? I don't know, I just want to go home, really. Yeah. Is there anything at all? There's just... Like, well, when I close my eyes and try and, I, I can, I try and sleep, I just go for like one sort of bad dream to the next. That sort of feels like... It wasn't really what I would have planned or expected. I didn't even realise that's what John needed, but looking back, I could see it was what he needed. It was like the first dose was like lulling him into it. It gave him a sense of, it's OK, I can do this. And then the second dose, it's like, right, now the real work begins. And the real work isn't experiencing some lovely feeling of love from the world. The work is going on a journey within yourself finding that nugget of pain and integrating it into your life. I'm really hoping and praying that it has worked. Up until now, um, with John being ill, I've been mum and dad to the kids. And now it might be that I can share the load again and it won't just be me, it'll be me and John together working as a team like we used to do all those years ago. It was just, uh, it, it got pretty horrible. Okay. And then uh, some very kind people convinced me to stay in the room. <laughs> Did they tie you down? No, no. <laughs> it was really? physical. Really? Actually, no physical restraint. <laughs> it was bad in terms of what I experienced, but necessary. Uh, for, Does it mean you didn't get rid of the beard? No, yeah. Oh. A man appeared to me and said, grow it till it's down to your knees. <sighs> <laughs> At first, I really didn't think it was working. It wasn't until the very end when I could sit and then reflect on it that I could see what had happened. All these things that had happened to me when I was a kid, it made me face every single one of them. And nobody wants to do that. But yeah, so it was an extremely horrible 
uh, afternoon. The worst experience of my life. Sometimes through it, I could hear bugs, as if a bug was crawling through the ground. So the images that I saw was, was of this massive, sort of black and red iron thing with huge spikes pointing out at it. But the experience that it relates to was when some kids had took my T-shirt off and threw me into this massive patch of nettles. And I was beat with uh, hawthorn branches. Um, and the bugs that I heard were the bugs that I heard when I was on the ground afterwards crying. The sharp spikes on the big black and red thing were the thorns on the, the branch. It was almost like absolutely everything was trying its hardest to say, this is the problem, <laughs> you know. It makes me feel that um, depression is a, a way we cope. As a kid, we, we build up psychological protections for ourselves around about these events, right? But at some point in your adult life, we have to come to terms with that and, and deal with it. Um, and there is no natural part of life that we have in modern society that allows that to happen. Counselling doesn't do it, antidepressants won't do it. But this, uh, this thing does do that. It takes you straight there. Uh, exactly what Robin promised, it will take you to a dark place. Whatever the problem is, it will take you straight to that. And you have to decide there and then whether you're going to be a victim of that for the rest of your life or not. John. Thank you. How are you doing? Yeah, much better. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. What was astounding was it wasn't some external spiritual force or it wasn't someone's counselling technique. It's your own self that does the healing in the end. If you look at these images, you can see the cortex, that's the outer part of the brain here. And this is a kind of spine to the cortex. And this seems to be particularly implicated in, in depression. Now, what psilocybin does is to introduce a degree of chaos, if you want, almost like a kind of scrambling effect. Mm -hmm. There's a kind of resetting of the brain and it, and it sort of settles into this, into a healthy uh, yeah. mo mode of function. That's the reason for the scan, for the difference. That's, that's what we're doing now, really, yeah. <clears throat> it's really interesting. <laughs> whether you'd have been able to walk around London a month ago. No, I wouldn't have done that. Coming into a place like London, like on Oxford Street and Regent Street, where it's so mobbed, I just wouldn't have done that. I'm enjoying it, you know, it's nice. There's, you're not sitting thinking about yourself or thinking about anything depressing or bad or dark or deep. It feels good, it feels there's like a lightness, you know. In fact, it, um, it is like a burden that's been lifted, that's what it feels like. It's if someone's just come along and they uh, taking away everything that was weighing you down. Today I just really want to get it over and done with, basically. I don't really have any hopes or predictions or ideas about what might happen or really Get on with it, really.
feel really tired, hungover. Massively abnormal feelings for me that I'm not sure if I've ever experienced in my adult life. Do you feel like it's something that you want to work on? I, I kind of want to work on it because I don't want to feel like this or, yeah, feel like this or how I felt for the majority of my life anymore. There was nothing that linked back to, like, this is what caused your depression, you know, use these tools and work it out. No, it's like, it's still a massive mystery to me. And is that disappointing? It's no more disappointing than every other day, so, yeah. I know the first Christmas, I had a red trike. So I'd got to be three and a half, I think. So it looks just, it's so much smaller than I remember. And you see the little window on the ground floor? Oh yeah. That's where I used to sit with Lynn on the stairs listening to it all kick off in the lounge. Going into the treatment, I thought, is it going to be the sort of conflict I had at work or is it going to be the family? Strangely, I've not even thought much about what happened at work. Although it was momentous, you know, for me then, it's kind of, it's autom automatically sort of just drifted back to, to what went on in that house down there. That's, 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 where, that's where the damage was done. Just give me a minute down here. This is probably the third or fourth time we've been back as a couple to see where he's lived. And all he's ever done is remembered it with fondness. This was where I grew up and I loved this and I did this and I did this with Dad and... And today it's just more painful. A change has occurred. There's no doubt about that. But a change has occurred. But it's not... <laughs> it's not the easy change that I thought it would be. It's a bit as though I had ingested a really, really good um, therapist. That's what, it, that's what it feels like. It feels as though I've got on board now <clears throat> my own therapist. OK. Cheers. Thank you so much and thanks for everything. Really. I know it's work in progress, but you know, I think I think things are moving in the in the right direction. I'm not sure whether it's correct or not, but the way I look at it is that I've been unhappy for so long that I think that unhappiness has spilt obviously into my life and my relationships. And I think there's a residue that's gotta be dealt with. But the other thing was this awful image that I had with the, uh, with the smothering. This, this, this awful image that, that... That your dad didn't want you, the rejection. Yeah, yeah. It was like a... Yeah. It was like a... God, it feels like a pillow over me. I could actually see the, the pillow and then suddenly the realisation was, you know, that I'm being smothered.
That feeling was real. Then the realization that it was Dad doing it was real. Did you? No. Did you really not want me that badly? All I can remember about my dad is good, and that's why I think I can't ever imagine him you know, wanting to dispatch me with a pillow. So I've got lovely memories of getting up at sort of 4.30 in the morning and, and going on his milk round. You know, these crystal clear images of those times that are really pleasant. Your mind will allow you to remember those things, those positive memories. Mm. Yeah. Anything that is confusing or conflictual mm. might be something that you want to keep away from yeah. Your, yeah. your memories and your, your yeah. conscious mind. Yeah. OK. okay for you. <sighs> Often in a psychedelic dose, the person will experience the same fragility, vulnerability, overwhelming horror as they did as a child. So I think that's what happened with Andy. He, he was stripped of his defences as an adult and taken back to that vulnerable place. What was real for Andy was his fear, a fear of annihilation and, and sense, a huge sense of rejection. And that, that theme of rejection is something that has plagued him his whole life. So that feels like it's really clinically significant. Bye now. Bye bye. bye. I wish that I would be able to work as his therapist and that it could be a, a longer course of treatment and that we could perhaps have another dosing and keep working on a process. Because then I really feel that huge breakthroughs could be made. I hope that from this, this dose, there will also be a significant improvement. But I think for kind of lifelong change, I feel that further therapy and further dosing sessions would probably be required. Finish. Yeah. Should we head out? Yeah. One of Mark's major problems is not his depression, but it's the fact that he doesn't know what he wants, and he wants other people to sort of help him and to tell him sort of what to do. Um, we've, we've really tried to encourage him to try and work out a little bit what he does want um, from life, but he, you know, he obviously, he's still you know, reports feeling quite lost. Um, and so it's a, it's a delicate balance really. But in, in the therapy, I think we'll be all about trying to get him to have a greater sense of himself and what he wants. School is tough for everyone. You know, I used to go in the library and try and read about how to act in public, how to, and it just felt very, very alien, the whole, you know, the whole concept of people having girlfriends, people having lots of friends. Everyone was different, but I felt very removed from everyone. I went to the doctors. He said, go to Amsterdam. I was like, mate, I'm 14, you know, you're, this is, you know, this is 1984, you're telling me to go to Amsterdam. What, what are you expecting me to do there? Because um, all I knew about Amsterdam, well, clogs, Anne Frank, prostitution and drugs. And it's, I didn't think he was telling me to go to the Anne Frank Museum. It was, and I thought, that's my, that's my GP. You know, I've been told by doctors, this is what it's going to be like. You know, nothing's going to change, you're going to be like this. And then you think, we start thinking, well, Actually, what's the fucking point, really? You know, thanks for that. The place where I grew up was this little village called Clareland. I can still see the, the field uh, and the Hawthorne sort of hedge where it all took place. I could, I could take you straight to the very place. And the thing was, it, it didn't happen that far from my home, but if I ever tried to complain about it to my mum, she would just go nuts and she would give me a good hammer. And then when Dad came home from work, he would come in, if, even if you were sleeping, you, you, would, you would get woken up and you'd be given another hammer, you know. That was, I think, when I really started having uh, sort of emotional problems, I think, as a kid. Of course, when these things are experienced, they can't be unexperienced, can they? And the typical response is to try and forget them. And yeah. Try and repress them. Perhaps 
the healthiest way to um, live with them is to live with them consciously. Yeah, because you can't change the past. There's no sense of wanting revenge or uh, no sense of being really angry at those events or the people that, that did them. There's just this sense of um, that's who made me who I am, <clears throat> part of what made me who I am, you know. It does mm. feel like there has been some kind of breakthrough. Yeah, it does feel like that. I feel enthusiastic to just go home and start getting on with things, yeah. you know. It's like a, just a desire to get up and get going now, you know, get up and get going. Do you have the mink in the tree? The black, yeah, the black the mink. mink in the tree. Is it dead? It's a sock. It's a sock. <laughs> First time we came up here, they were running up like this way ahead of us. No, we had the dog. We did. We knew that the dog. Yeah. When was that? Um, a long time ago. I've not done this since the depression got bad. And it feels nice. It feels good. Well, I feel like I think it feels good. A bit weird. It's not normal anymore, is it? Yeah. <clears throat> but weird sounds negative. I don't, I don't think you mean that, do you? I don't know. It's weird. It's just strange having John here because I've been used to life on my own for so long. Six months after the trial, the results are presented to the media. Control S, Control S, Control S. Set up a file, Control S. Every time you change it, Control S, right? Usually fine, it's the last minute. This is a celebration as well as a press conference. Because it's taken, taken four years to get here. Yeah. Taken four years to get here. And, and three of those years were kind of unnecessary. They're just ploughing through regulatory hurdles. But we did it. And so how important is today then? Today's the birth of a new era in the treatment of depression, I would say. It's the first depression trial with a psychedelic drug. So it is, it's landmark stuff. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the SMC uh, for this morning's briefing. Um, psilocybin, an option for treatment-resistant depression, um, to be published in Last Psychiatry. Embargo is 10.30 p.m. tomorrow. The average duration of the illness in this sample was 18 years, so many of the patients have had depression for actually most of their adult lives, yet uh, eight of the 12 were essentially depression-free, one week post-treatment, and five remained depression-free, uh, three months post-treatment. You can see some relapse in some of the patients, so let's not get carried away. This isn't a magic cure. Even so, um, the effects at this stage do look promising. How would you envisage this being dosed? Would it be kind of a one-off treatment or would it be repeated? Well, I think that's what we need to find out. The key question is what to do with the people who got an initial benefit and then it starts to wane. So we're thinking about trying to set up what you might call a kind of uh, more naturalistic study. So perhaps that those people could then be redosed every three months and just see if the, if the effect came back. I mean, uh, it, it might, it might not. Depressed people have a view of the world, which is that the world is a nasty, hostile place. And of course, they're right, because it is. But after psilocybin, the depressed people tended to view the world the same way as we do, which is it's, it's better than it is. And that's a great defense. Yeah. What would be the process for a drug like psilocybin to move from schedule one to schedule two? What are the sort of reasons that it isn't happening? 
Yeah, I, I would say a major reason is because of the United Nations conventions and the schedules under those conventions um, that a country like the UK tends to follow. And that those conventions very clearly includes psilocybin within Schedule 1. So to, to move against the UN conventions, you really need some strong evidence. So it's a sort of chicken and egg situation. If psilocybin were put into Schedule 2, this would make it much easier for researchers to get hold of it, to get a license. You know, the whole thing would be freed up. You'd then have lots of research. And, and if it showed that psilocybin really helped people with depression, you'd get change. But getting that research to happen while these drugs are in Schedule 1 is very difficult. Do you have any regrets about doing the trial? I suppose really only in that what it revealed to me. I think with a high dose, um, the experiences were, were profound and pretty dark. It introduced me to the fact that something really nasty could have happened in my childhood and you can't kind of unthink that but it kind of leaves you with the feeling of well was that the case did it you know was i was i smothered as an infant there's two sides i suppose that you say well if i'd not learned that then maybe the recovery process wouldn't wouldn't be working hasn't worked or does knowing it actually make the whole situation worse but yeah i'd do it again you know that's it introduces you to a possible solution for depression it was a little bit empowering it it made me think, well, perhaps I'm not just a, like a passenger on this bloody, you know, merry-go-round. It might be that I can actually do something about it. There could be a whole new way of accessing the, the subconscious the psyche, whatever, whatever it is. Mm. Right. Life with John is pretty much like it was before the trial. Crap. Putting it bluntly. I hoped that the results from the trial would last forever because it was it was so nice. The kids had their dad back and to a certain extent I had my husband back and it's gone again. It's just it's all gone. Oh, that's my favourite one. We were just all together. It was a really nice day. It was the 5th of March, and we've not been out for a walk together since. Which is kind of sad. I feel pretty rotten, to be honest. I know Robin said that, that nobody's went back as bad as they were before, but um, I don't think it would take much longer before I was back where I was. The darkness has gradually came back, the self-loathing comes back, the desire to be cut off from the world comes back. 
Then what happens is it gets compounded. You feel guilty that you are like that. Then you feel guilty that your family have to suffer through that. Misery doesn't like to have enjoyable surroundings. Somebody in a, in merely a city living in a tenement flat might think this is paradise, but I loathe it. The only thing I want is, is a room where no windows and a door, you know, where you're just going to shut it and spend the rest of your life there. Come on, you got it, good boy. Good boy. So the trial's over now, Robin. How do you feel? Glad it's done, slightly exhausted. Um, pleased it went so well. Uh, on the other hand, a little frustrated that the fact that we can't deliver this treatment, you know, when people need it. It's just being here in central London and it being so busy, you know, they say one in 10 people are suffering from depression. That's likely a few people around us right now. It's a massive problem. So what are the results look like? Well, Andy, Mark and John, Andy and John showed quite a good initial response, um, especially John, but then they dipped back, so on average, they weren't the best responders. But if you take the whole group at three weeks, roughly half were in remission, meaning essentially they're depression free. That's after, on average, about 18 years of depression. Uh, six months, six, uh, still depression free. So it's quite promising, really. And are there any depression free sort of two years later? Sort of like yeah, yeah, there are, yeah. Some people's lives have just been transformed. It suggests that the treatment seems to work at least as well as conventional treatments. What we want to do next is compare it against conventional treatments. We need bigger trials, more rigorously designed trials, double-blind, randomised control trials. Uh, and fortunately, that's happening now. So a few teams around the world are uh, running these studies, major investments coming in as a multi-site trial across Europe and the US and Canada, 15 different countries. So for things to be you know, expanding to the scale that they are right now is really exciting. That is definitely one. Speaking to guys on the trial afterwards they said yeah probably if you'd had a stronger dose or a third dose you would have had you know a breakthrough but I'd, I don't know if I can risk going picking a load of these and sitting in my bedroom tripping my nuts off and going ah oh, I've got no support I don't you know I don't know what I'm doing I did feel as though I failed I failed the test so did it not work at all I mean obviously I experienced a major amount of weirdness, but it opened up a lot of questions about my, um, like my illness, but it never, never really kind of pointed me in the right direction of any answers. And maybe there aren't any answers, and that's just something I've got to deal with. A couple of months he's not been as good as he was before but he's still the same person as he was four or five years ago before um, and we just saw that same person again a few months back so it was nice but uh, it'd be better if they would do it again so that it would be nice to have him back again do you believe in psilocybin oh yeah because uh, I've seen what, it, what it's done, and uh, it worked like a miracle, really. Uh, we never thought it would, it would be like that again, and then he took the trial, and it was great. Yeah, it was, it was really good. 
few months after the trial, Dad was really good and it was really good to see him happy and the rest of us happy and I think it made him feel happy that everyone else was happy as well. But I don't think it was a bad thing that we saw it. Like, it was nice to see it. But, and they're memories that we're all going to keep forever. It's like, it's better seeing those memories than not having them. Every week, thousands of people who could benefit from interventions with these drugs are denied access. And that means they will continue with their depressions and their addictions. That is outrageous. It, there is no need to limit access of these drugs for medical research, but the current regulations make it almost impossible for anyone to use them clinically. In some respects, it's worse than before. I know there's something out here that will help. Uh, this the frustration that I can't really uh, make, take full advantage of that. Who's benefiting from that? Well, I'm not benefiting because I'm not getting treatment. My children don't benefit because I'm not working and showing them what a proper father and a proper person should be doing with their life to be a productive part of society. Other people who need help don't benefit because money's being spent on me when I could be back at work. Do you want me to do the poultry at the top? Yeah, I'm not going up there when there's a billy goat. <laughs> mm -hmm. 